Morena, and welcome to BDO's uh, Rethink series. Uh, for those who have been part of our uh, webinar series, you'll remember in 2020, following the uh, start of COVID, BDO started to run a webinar series all about rethinking your business, looking at resetting, building resilience, and uh, working about realizing and understanding where your business is going to go through these uh, interesting times. Here we find ourselves again in lockdown four, and today's series is quite apt. We're looking at productivity. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ganesh Nana from uh, New Zealand Productivity Commission, he's here, and Gurdon Lincoln from uh, Productivity People, he's the Managing Director. Both are going to talk to today's uh, webinar series, which will be available later on our website. We are recording this on the productivity and what it means uh, for New Zealand businesses, particularly the aspect of productivity. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Ganesh, who will lead uh, to a 15, 20 minute presentation, followed by Gurton, and then there is time for Q&A afterwards. Just to remind you, just use the chat um, facility Q&A that is on your uh, laptop or desk uh, top and fire through your Q&A. I will then uh, feed those through to uh, either speaker. Just let us know which one, um, otherwise I'll direct the question to. Right, I'll hand over to Dr. Ganesh. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, pleasure to be here somewhat remotely, but uh, I hope you're all safe in your bubbles and uh, looking after yourselves. It's uh, been a bit of a bit of a journey, I suppose, is the jargon and uh, undoubtedly um, somewhat stressful for many of us and it's all different and it's all uncertain and I suppose that's one of the critical elements that um, makes life just more than more difficult and I know businesses hate uncertainty. It was one of the things that in my previous role when I was a forecaster where it was a bit of a cliche we always say that businesses hate uncertainty whether it be policy or politics or economics and uh, like to have a plan from our leaders so that then we could budget accordingly and and, and deliver uh, good products or services to our customers and our stakeholders. But um, that uncertainty word has taken on a totally different meaning in the last sort of 12 to 15 months and uh, we're going to have to take it seriously. Um, so all the best to everybody and uh, let's uh, we'll hunker down for a little bit of a chat about productivity. My name's Ganesh. I'm a first generation New Zealander, born and bred here in Whanganui Atara, Wellington. Um, and uh, latterly, or quite recently, been appointed chair of the Productivity Commission. Uh, for those who don't know, the purpose of the commission is to advise the government on productivity, uh, but also uh, in our legislation, it's quite clear that it's not just productivity we advise government on, it's advising government on productivity in a way that will support the overall well-being of all New Zealanders, and I'm quoting from the legislation here, having regard to a wide variety of communities of interest and population groups in New Zealand society. And, and that's what guides us, that's the purpose that's in our legislation when we were first set, originally set up in 2010. Um, and it's quite a broad ambit and if you look at that definition or the, that purpose that we have, it's not just productivity we're after, it's a particular type of productivity. It's a productivity that does deliver or can deliver well-being and I think that's the um, that's the lens through which I look at it and I make no apologies for that. Uh, and it is a part of my co-papa is uh, embracing different perspectives on productivity and indeed what do we mean by well-being to improve uh, not just the productivity in a narrow sense but in, uh, improve productivity and well-being in the broader sense possible so that we actually do deliver not just to our shareholders and our owners and not just to our own individual stakeholders but to the broader communities within which we all operate. Um, 
what I'd probably like to do, just I suppose moving on, I've got about five key elements I just want to cover off in these, these few minutes I've got and then hopefully uh, keen on a Q&A session with you. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about what the difference is between productivity and GDP, which is probably one of those convenient terms that economists like to talk about. Uh, and then moving a little bit forward to what my version of, dare I say, well not my version, what the broader version of economics and productivity would embrace. And I use the phrase kaitiaki tangara taonga, uh, just the guardianships of our guardian, acting as guardians of the resources that we have. I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then moving on to how do we change the narrative and what sort of competing or complementary model we might want to look at and then what is the value proposition for all of us when we're bringing these things together. Just the right up front, uh, if you don't know already, GDP has been a measure that's been around for quite a long time. It's sort of a cornerstone of macroeconomics. It was never ever a measure of well-being or indeed never a measure of outcomes. It very much is a measure of outputs um, and it's been used, um, dare I say, not very helpfully uh, by some economists as a measure of prosperity. Uh, and I think we've got to get past that. What does GDP actually measure? It's driven by market valuations. And so in some places, market valuations are right. Uh, and appropriate, but in some places it's very imperfect. Uh, for example, what is the value of our essential workers literally today when we're in lockdown? It's definitely a lot more than the minimum wage that, dare I say, many of those essential workers are on. Um, GDP does not measure uh, the value of unpaid work, much of the work that we're doing around the house and the home today. It doesn't measure voluntary work. Many of our volunteers are out there looking after us here and now. So there's, there's some quite serious misgivings in terms of using GDP as an overall measure of, of prosperity, let, let alone well-being. I suppose one of the more important ones that I would focus on is that GDP is inherently a short-term measure. It measures today's production or delivery of services or today's spending. It doesn't, it's not very good at looking at the impact on tomorrow. And that's what I'd like to focus on or refocus or encouraging a refocus. And if you're looking at from a very business perspective, think of it as take um, GDP as a measure that's focused on your profit and loss account, which is very much today or this year. It tends not to focus on the balance sheet. And that's what I'd like to turn our attention to. If you're looking at it from that, I won't say narrow, but if you're looking at it from an individual or a household perspective, it is, let's take our, or well, not take our focus off, but let's move our focus, not so much on the today, on the profit and loss, but towards that balance sheet. And what does the balance sheet show? It's meant to show our assets and liabilities and our equity. And I know most uh, businesses, when they turn to, I won't say most of generalising, but many businesses and directors, when they turn to, turn to balance sheets, have a habit of focusing on the liability side and look at your debt to equity ratios and those sorts of things. I'd like to focus on that asset side because it's those assets or those resources from an economic perspective that enable us to deliver well-being into the future. The assets are the well-being, the stock, of the resources that we have that we pass on to future generations. That are the, uh, what's available to us if we're looking at well-being into the future. Uh, and indeed, uh, a point to the Treasury Living Standards Framework, which indeed looks at four capitals or what I would term four sets of assets that we have available to us as a nation uh, in terms of being able to deliver well-being into the future. And so that's where I, I draw that parallel of just shifting a little bit from the today to the tomorrow, or well, not a little bit, shifting more away from the today and towards the tomorrow, from the P&L towards that balance sheet, from the income and spending today towards the assets that we have available and looking after those assets and, and what are the state of those assets. Um, Treasury Living Standards Framework has sort of four groups of assets. They turn, you know, natural capital, 
uh, which is the environment and the climate and biodiversity. And we've had a few questions and answers about those sorts of things. Physical capital, that's the bricks and mortar and the infrastructure. And dare I say, we haven't been great in looking after those. Um, human capital, that's our people, our skills and our experiences. We can argue about how well we've looked after those and invested in developing that element of capital. And then that fourth capital, which some people have difficulty with, which is that social capital, which I'll talk a little bit further about in a second, um, just conscious of time. Um, we're moving from the Treasury Living Standards Framework, all that, that from the resources or the assets or the balance sheet focus, I then go towards, well, what do we want to do with those resources? Well, we actually need to look after them if you've got, in my vision, an intergeneration co-papa. So it's not the this year, and indeed it's probably not even next year, it's next generation. Uh, and so that's a, definitely a long-term time horizon. And you can think about that in a business context. Your business is long-lived. It is, um, if, you're, if you're performing your role as a director, you should be looking at what is the state of your business and can, is it able to be passed on to the next group of directors, the next group of stakeholders, or indeed the next generation? And if it isn't, what are we doing now to make sure it is, in the jargon, I suppose, of today, resilient to uh, all the challenges of today as well as tomorrow? And that's where I use the phrase uh, from Te Reo Māori um, and Te Ao Māori perspectives are about being kaitiaki. Let's view ourselves as guardians of not just the balance sheet, but more particularly guardians of the assets that we have on our balance sheet. Uh, and so guardians in the context of um, our, I'd say our taonga, our treasures that we have that have been passed on down to us that we've looking after that we need to pass on. That's, I suppose, my uh, I suppose my version of economics, but my version of productivity. Productivity is very much about how are we looking after those resources? How are we acting in our role as guardians of those resources um, and treasures? And perhaps just pushing that metaphor a little bit further, when we look at assets, and I know, or resources, or dare I say capitals, um, there's one view of the world which tends to look at resources as being something that we should use uh, and, dare, and, and use in terms of whether we're using our people or our bricks and mortar to deliver things or produce things, which then other people spend on, which is one way of looking at those resources. I would actually say, let's look, uh, if we're serious about being a guardian and being in guardianship of those resources, Let's look at those rather than resources as being something that we can use or dare I say exploit that some people have gone down that road. Let's look more about, um, well, we need to look after those resources. How do we protect them? How do we enjoy them? And how do we indeed enrich them for the future? And that's that investment uh, element. We've got to actually spend not so much on the P&L, but spend on the assets to make sure that they are in the jargon, we're investing in those assets, we're not only maintaining them, but improving them. And looking further um, in terms of those treasures, in terms of that social capital, um, let's not forget that many of us, whether we're um, in corporates or not-for-profits or, it'd be, dare I say, government agencies, we operate in a community that provides us with a social license. The community um, across um, yeah, across the spectrum provides us with a um, a license or uh, provides us or has trust in us delivering. There's some re there's some respect and trust in institutions that society and community have that enable us to deliver stuff. And that goes for corporates as well as governments and not for profits. If we lose that social license, uh, it makes life just a whole lot more difficult for us as organisations to operate. And I think that's one part of that asset on our balance sheet that we ignore at our peril and where whereabouts, whether we are corporates or indeed government or not for profits or indeed voluntary organisations as well. And I think that's where um, those elements or those uh, 
those things that make us uh, businesses, corporates, not-for-profits that enable us to deliver not just products and services, but enable us to deliver well-being and enable us to um, look after and nurture those assets and those taonga that are on our balance sheets is helped immensely by the social license that we've been given by the communities within which we operate. We cannot take that for granted and dare I, some of those, some of our organisations have ignored that and, 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 and have pushed that social license beyond um, beyond what they should and, and some of those organisations felt that through last year. One of the best examples was those organisations that applied for the, the wage subsidy and then decided to pocket it and not play by the rules of the game. We, that trust in institutions is, is there because most communities believe that the organisations will play by the rules of the game. When we push those further, we risk that social licence. And I do, do credit to many and most organisations across both the corporate, across the corporate governance, government and indeed um, not-for-profit sector. We all, many, 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 most majority do play by the rules of the game. It's unfortunately, it just takes one bad apple to spoil it for all of us. And that's part of our role as leaders and whether we're, and that's that broader stakeholder uh, role that we have to play or the broader governance role that we have to play. We do have to call out those who don't play by the rules of the game because they mess it up for all of us. Um, so in terms of changing the narrative, just a couple of more points. Um, that economy, we've got this whole thing about who's going to save the economy uh, in lockdown level four. Um, my worry is that economy is interpreted as spending. Retail, we can't spend, so somebody's not, so the economy is messed up. We've got to change the narrative. The economy is not spending, and most economists should be able to tell you that. Otherwise, they're not economists. Economics or that economy is all about resources. That was chapter one of the textbook. Whether you interpret those resources as capitals or as assets, or in my world as taonga, it's that economy that needs saving. And so, yes, we've got to save our people, our human capital. We've got to save our natural resources. We've got to save the bricks and mortar. Dare I say, level four lockdown, most of those assets are still there. The human capital element is the one that's fragile. That's the one that's being um, in peril at the moment. So that's the one that we should be focusing on and saving if we're serious about saving the economy, definitely for the future. And I make, again, no, no apologies for that. Uh, productivity, productivity is not profitability. And I probably don't need to say that in this audience, but in many other audiences, Productivity is interpreted as profitability. So we've got to make sure when we, in the narrative, when we're talking about productivity, we, we're not being, it's not being perceived as uh, big corporates lining up at the front of the queue wanting more. We've got to talk about productivity in the context, in my mind, in the context of delivering well-being, um, in the context of looking after our capitals, uh, whether it's the ones individual or the ones in our corporate or in our organisation, or indeed broader in the context of that social licence to operate that we need to protect. Value, um, value, we've got to get beyond market-based transactions. Value is aligned to what we all individually and collectively value. And that's that we all have value statements or many of us will have value statements on our websites. Um, as the things that we value, well, we need to draw the links there so that we get away from the, the P&L. Yes, it's important. We get away from GDP. Yes, it's important. But we move towards a more broader set of well, of value and thereafter well-being. Um, many other models out there in terms of economic models, and some of you may have heard of the donut economics um, model of the economy. It is about resilience. It's about recognising that there are constraints, um, whether they be environmental or indeed social. Uh, and I think that's the the world that we're operating in, whether it's the ESG model of governance or whether it's the triple bottom lines or whether it's the four capitals. The world is becoming a lot more complicated um, and, dare I say, uncertain. Um, 
lastly, I just bring to water, second to last, I just bring um, the model that I'm quite that that treasury or not treasury, but treasury have picked up beside the living standards framework is a he ara wai ora framework, a, a, a pathway to well-being, which uh, I'd encourage some, uh, I'd encourage you to look up on the treasury website. Um, and it brings together a te ao Māori perspective around um, participation and connection and obligations, mutual obligations, um, opportunity and capability, uh, income, wealth and intergeneration prosperity. And what I think, and it's not up for me because it's not my framework, but what I believe is quite central and critical, that sense of identity and belonging. And that goes back to the communities that we operate in and whether they're direct stakeholders in your organisation or whether they're peripheral or whether they're just part of that social licence to operate. All of us need a sense of identity and belonging if we're ever going to be productive, if we're ever going to be productive, either in the narrow sense or in the broader sense of delivering well-being. Uh, and so lastly, I just want to share my last slide, if I can, which is um, sort of my summary. Um, and that's the slide which hopefully you should be able to see, which is around what needs to change. Uh, and some of it we've got already, but the value proposition, and I think this is for all of us, whether we're organisations in the corporate sector or the not-for-profit or indeed for government. Um, that shift towards the long term is something that we've really got to nail uh, here in Aotearoa. We've focused on the short term for too long and we've neglected the assets on our balance sheet, whether individually or as a collective. And I'll talk about the not just the bricks and mortar assets, but dare I say the people and that social license to operate. Um, we ignore that at our peril. Um, and we won't even talk about the natural environment because it's it's a no brainer that we have uh, ignored that for a lot, quite a while. We've got to value quality rather than the race to the bottom. So are we serious about when we put out tenders that we're not going to choose the least cost? We are going to choose the one that delivers quality. We've got to value relationships, whether that be at the treaty level, whether that be between business and community in terms of the social license, or dare I say, between government and people in terms of whose voices are being heard, making sure that it's not just the uh, not just the loudest voices or the most powerful voices. We've got to make sure that we hear the voices of the silent and that's very hard and around the board table if you're serious about your social license who are the people that are not at the table who are not being heard and again um, i cannot stress too much what that impact would have on our own productivity not to mention our broader productivity if we lose that social license and yet let's get serious about valuing outcomes rather than outputs um, valuing those assets um, that should be on our balance sheet that probably aren't, um, rather than just valuing GDP. I'll leave that with you uh, and um, happy to move forward, hand over to Gurton and then come back for Q&A later. Kia ora. Thank you, uh, Ganesh. Um, it's been um, yeah, it's been privileged. I've heard your message before, and um, it's both uh, inspiring and uncomfortable at the same time. Uh, but that's uh, that's what required uh, to initiate change. Um, I really like uh, the way you've uh, you've redefined uh, productivity and uh, terms of well-being, and I will build on that uh, when I when I talk through um, um, through my session here. So um, I'm uh, honoured to to share the stage with you. Uh, so thank you and uh, Namaste. Uh, thank you, David, as well for uh, for inviting me, and thank you, BDO, for making productivity priority for uh, for New Zealand. Uh, building resilience into firms and into our economy in these uncertain times is essential, uh, and uh, really appreciate that uh, BDO is is leading uh, leading that for uh, for New Zealand. 
So to the business owners and others who have tuned in to the, uh, to the webinar, Tēnā Kota Katoa, Ko Gietalinke Kitoko Inua. Thank you for joining. Um, we are encouraged by the, by the high turnout uh, and simply by joining uh, today, you're displaying the single biggest trait uh, needed to improve productivity of your firm, uh, a learning and a growth mindset. So, so this will be the practical part of, uh, of the, web, uh, the webinar. So today, I will talk to you about how you can improve your firm's productivity. Now, there are a lot of reasons why New Zealand's uh, productivity is low or is lagging behind uh, other OECD nations. And you know, Ganesha touched on that. And you know, there are like monetary policy, maybe immigration rules, uh, our access to capital, um, having an innovation friendly environment, uh, even our distance to market. But those are all uh, in your circle of interest or um, your uh, circle of influence. You know, today, what I want to talk to you about is what is in your circle of control? What is it you can do for your firm now? Yeah, how can you become more resilient in these uncertain times? So I will use four questions um, for uh, your productivity journey. And I'd like you to think about that while I, while I ask this question and explain uh, the background to that. So the four questions center around the measurement of productivity within your firm, uh, strategy alignment, how do we align uh, our people around our strategy? Uh, the reviews, the daily team reviews that we do um, um, uh, in terms of productivity and empowering teams in improvement activity. And then I'll finish with uh, why productivity is so important right now uh, and for our future as well. Uh, but first, let me bust the myth about productivity and strains and hard to pronounce names like Ganesh and Gierton. You don't have to have an exotic sounding name to understand and improve productivity. Uh, so whew, let's uh, let's get on with it. Uh, so let's return to Ganesha's presentation and the key point of rethinking, reframing and redefining productivity. So what I heard there is that productivity is about uh, positive choices and opportunities for New Zealand for us now, but mostly for for future generations. And that's quite a change because traditionally productivity is is seen as yeah, our outputs over our inputs, our financial returns, and only of interest to the shareholders of an organization. But as Denise mentioned as well, uh, all the other stakeholders benefit from an improved productivity. Uh, our customers benefit from it, the community we operate benefit from it, and our staff uh, benefit from it as well. And that's what I want to talk about most today. The most important stakeholder in this instance is your staff. You know, they're the ones that are going to deliver productivity um, for your firm, uh, not you, the owner. So your staff, your people, uh, want to have the satisfaction of a, of a productive day. Uh, they don't want to do rework. They don't have to do work. They don't want to do work again. They don't want to have delays or having to wait for things or having things broken down and not working. They don't want to get conflicting instructions. You know? They don't want to have onerous, complicated processes. They want to know at the end of the day that they have contributed to a successful day. So it's important to keep looking at productivity through the eyes of staff as the key stakeholder in delivering productivity. So the four questions that I'll be talking to you uh, about today, and we'll share these with the materials after, after the webinar. Um, question number one, have you measured your productivity? Have you analyzed how close you are to the maximum? And do you have a strategic intent to bridge that gap? Now, it's our experience that most firms in New Zealand that have not thought about this are about 30 to 50 you percent know, productive. That sounds like a really low, low number, but when we measure productivity, we, we find that time and time again. And these are, these are successful businesses. They turn a profit. You know? Some of these firms sell more than they can make, and they then want to build additional capacity or take on more people to meet that demand. And at the same time, there's headroom or there's unlocked capacity that, um, that has been installed and has been paid for. So putting additional capital and labor in is not productivity, that's, that's capacity. So how do you look at productivity then? So by analyzing the work, by removing or reducing non-productive activities, these firms can typically double their productivity in less than a year with uh, concerted effort. And we've seen this time and time again. You know, it's, it's like magic. Uh, except it isn't. You know? It's like the old saying, the mind is like a parachute. If it's not open, it's not going to work. 
So productivity improvement is about using tried and trusted methods uh, of the world's best firms. And when you then look at what are the levels of productivity firms achieve globally, you know, some industry best practice, you know, we're looking at uh, in the in the 80 80 percent plus um, of of effective productivity, and others like in the oil and gas industry up in the high 90s, even you know, towards 99 percent. So how do we measure this? Let's talk about that. And for some situation, a measurement uh, of productivity is a lot easier than for others. Probably the easiest process to talk about is if you're making widgets. So when you make widgets, you look at time the, the line is running, the speed the line is running, and the number of quality units that you uh, that you produce versus defects. Now, if this is not 100%, that is seen as a productivity loss. And when you're achieving 90% on each of those, that may sound very good, but your overall productivity is still only 73%, 90% times 90% times 90%. Again, you know, this is an easy example. Um, and if your business model is, is harder to measure uh, productivity, it doesn't mean you can't, cannot measure it. In fact, if we compare this with uh, with the recent Olympics, you know, there are some sports that are a lot easier to measure you know, success than, than others as well. For instance, Lisa Carrington, you know, she won three golds, very easy to measure, first cross the line, fastest time, you know, done deal. And then we'll look at diving. In diving, it's a bit harder to measure. You get points awarded you know, for your moves, you get points deducted, there's multiple judges, but in the end, there's an agreement who is the winner. It's harder to measure, it's a more difficult, more complicated you know, process, but it's still doable. But think about this, if this is harder for your business you know, to measure productivity, and you're able to do this well, compared to your, you know, the others that are playing in that market, productivity measurement and improvement can well become a competitive advantage. So recapping question one, measure your gap to zero loss, build your plan to close this gap, have strategic intent to improve your productivity. Which takes us then to question number two, have you created a clear line of sight for your people to the vision and the strategy? Are you connecting your staff in, uh, in uh, to the strategy? Are you involving them in the development in the cascade of strategy? Have you cascaded that strategy to the people that deliver the services to your customers uh, or make your products. Because you can't do strategy, you can't do objectives. Therefore, you cannot expect your people to make the connection between the strategy poster that's out on the wall that they walk past and their daily activity. You need to, as a leader, understand what is it that they can do yeah, and what they can do is to complete tasks and actions. So it's the role of the leader to cascade that strategic intent to actionable plans and tasks. Teams need to be able to provide input and they need to have a choice in a voice. Because staff are not necessarily motivated by the company's high level KPIs, by the company's EBIT or revenue. They're motivated by beating their last record, by beating the other shift, by seeing their improvement idea implemented and successful. And in, in having a voice and a choice in where the where the business is going, having input in terms of what the team wants to improve. So recapping question two: align your people with your strategic intent to improve your productivity. Which brings us then to the third question. Now we're into the execution, right? How do we know that we're we're on track? So question number three is: Is your team routinely measuring and discussing operational performance? So when I walk into businesses, um, I'm often amazed at what I don't see. Yeah, I don't see what I see every Saturday morning. You know, when I talk to the people in the uh, in those organisations, I talk about their Saturday morning, about their kids' sports. You know, the 12 year old playing netball or the 10 year old playing rugby, and we talk about that and ask, so what do you see along the sideline? And they all say school boards. You know, we are desperately measuring the scores of our children's sports games. And uh, if the school board in all black mats were, uh, were to break down, there'd be a riot. But people are more than often happy to work in an environment where there's no for, no any form of, of school board. I'm not sure whether, whether we're being successful or not. We're not sure whether we're behind or whether we're ahead. We're not sure if we're improving. So most, form, most firms actually do you know, reviews of performance, and they're largely management reviews. Uh, often financial targets, 
mostly monthly results, uh, but not always uh, operational results and using short interval controls. Then I talked to those firms around their toolbox meetings. I asked, do you do you know, meetings with your staff around performance? And they say, yeah, every business does them. But often it's just a one way download of instructions and information. So we talked them about you know, putting these toolbox meetings on steroids. You know, make them focused on performance, on action. You know, aim them at team success. Every team has the right to know, you know, the right to measure for themselves whether they have been successful or not. Because success as a team is the strongest driver of job satisfaction, the strongest motivator, and we want to unlock our staff intrinsic motivation. We want them you know, to, uh, to drive that productivity. So when we talk about you know, toolbox or reviews on steroids, every person in any job really needs to understand three questions every single day. So the first, the first question is then, did we achieve what we we're supposed to achieve as a team? Did we hit our team targets? Did we hit customer delivery? Did we get our quality right? Did we hit our productivity measures? And did we keep ourselves safe? What, were, what about our material losses? What didn't go well? If it didn't go well, why not? What is the issue? And what's the action? Who will take that action and by when? And then question three, so what's the plan for today? And you know, what, what do we need to achieve today? What does success look like in the end of today? And then you make those reviews highly visual. You know, make those daily reviews visual. You use red greens and we talk about the five meter three second rule. So your customer service team, I want to be able to walk up to the customer service team and, and see from five meters away in three seconds, you know, what complaints we're still uh, needing to close out and what orders we still need to fulfill and what level of, of response that we have to our customers. I want to see you know, the sales team. I want to see, you know, how well are we on track for our regional plans? I want to understand for the warehouse dispatch area, you know, what is our workload and are we going to make, make target years enough? Because productivity is not a, a project. It's not a, a once in a while thing. Productivity is a day by day, hour by hour activity that we need to we need to drive. Because I cannot undo where we have not met performance, but can I can then take action to recover, to bring everything back on track. And the faster that cadence is, you know, the more likely we're not going to go off track. Uh, but remember, you know, tomorrow, Thursday, uh, it's not going to be better than today, Wednesday, just because it happens to be Thursday. It will only be better tomorrow if we work in a different, in a better way. It's the action, the improvement action that we take from our daily review where the real prize is. There's no prize for understanding whether we're on track or off track. It's not even a prize for defining what the action is. The only prize is from doing the action. And also encourage that action orientation. Which leads us then to the fourth and final question. Are you empowering your teams to make improvements to their work? And everybody, everybody will likely say, yes, of course we do. But our observations show a different picture. So if there's a customer complaint or in the manufacturing facilities, the line stops. What do we see? We often see managers or supervisors jump in. And quite often this is from a very benevolent uh, attitude and mindset. It is to help and support the team. They want to support the team. But what are we actually communicating? And when we are jumping in and saying, you guys go over there while well, I'll go and sort this out for you. What we're actually communicating is, is the team smart enough to be able to come up with the solution? Are they worthy of my time to train and coach them to that, to that um, resolution? Again, it's a benevolent attitude that we have, uh, but it actually has some serious side effects that we need to address. Now, we call this under delegation, and it's a recurring uh, observation in, in New Zealand businesses. Middle managers and even senior managers need to resist the urge to address those situational or, or on the event issues. Instead, they should spend their time coaching the operational staff to solve these problems. This will address a number of, uh, number of issues. First, it's going to you know, uh, reduce the ongoing need for leaders to stay involved in that day-to-day -day operation, you know, to be in the weeds. Uh, it's also going to take away that you know, lack of respect maybe operational staff may experience when, when they're sent to the side. And most importantly, it's going to free up time for leaders to make the systemic and strategic improvements that you're recruited or you're hired to, uh, to, to, uh, to implement. 
So leaders need to shift to become teachers. So let me recap the four questions and the actions following from this. Measure your productivity and make improvements part of your strategic intent. Create a line of sight for your people you know, to strategy and vision. Ensure daily reviews are held, assign actions, and empower your teams in improvement activity. So imagine you're doing all of this really well. Imagine the institutional knowledge and power your organization will have. Imagine the resilience you will have built into the organization. You're not going to be dependent on these specialists. You're not going to be dependent on that one manager that can get everything to go. But you have an entire organization aligned, focused and empowered on the company goal. Now, this process doesn't require capital. It doesn't require labor. It doesn't require renegotiation of contracts. And it doesn't further degrade our natural environment or our climate. It requires dedication to the process of improvement. It's a concept that is paradoxically easy to comprehend, but at the same time hard to implement. So let me finish on why this is so important for New Zealand. So Ganesh talked about choices and opportunities. Yeah, if we reverse our slide on the global productivity rankings, it's about our nation's access to world-class healthcare and education. It's about investing in our infrastructure. It's about protecting our natural environment. And this is the endowment we can make to future generations. And I want to be part of that generation that holds the slide and provides the opportunities for our Tamariki and our Mokapuna. And I be believe your business can be part of this change too. I've seen what successes it will lead to. So I can only encourage you to build resilience in your, into your organization by putting productivity front and center of your strategy. Thank you again, uh, BDO and David, for inviting me. No reira. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Namihi, and back to you, David. Good, and thank you very much. Uh, why don't I just jump straight into some questions? Um, and there's a few coming in. Ganesh, this will be the uh, first for you, and it's about um, the, the outcomes, measuring outcomes. Uh, we, We've heard of the triple bottom line. We've heard of the four capitals. Uh, our accounting standards are now asking some organizations to start uh, producing a statement of service performance. The question uh, raised by a couple of people, and it is around this measurement, do other countries measure productivity the way you're considering? Are we unique uh, in benchmarking our success? Um, and how do we actually move people to start measuring more than just gross domestic product and start looking at these other uh, measures? Um, well, short answer, um, other countries are looking at different ways of measuring. I think it's it's not we're not peculiar in questioning GDP as a measure as a as a primary measure of prosperity. And most economists and, and through the economics discipline, there is a lot of discussion and um, argument uh, about the use of GDP and about the use of other indicators. Uh, so that's, and, and that's not really that new, um, it, but it has accelerated quite recently given the realization that GDP hasn't, um, hasn't delivered us the right measures that some of us might be interested in. And, uh, and I think one of the other particular ones that has driven that is the, the, the distributional impact and GDP doesn't measure uh, how that income has been distributed across different groups in the community. So that's just another um, motivation to question it. Uh, so other countries are, are looking and questioning similarly, but New Zealand is unique and I don't think we should be uh, reluctant to develop our own uh, measures or our own perspectives on it. Uh, in, in that's not going. To, that's not saying it's going to be easy. Uh, I, I do think there's a challenge in front of us in terms of using some of the the more comfortable measures that some of us might be uh, well, might be comfortable with. You know, the OECD have developed uh, indicator. I think it's Better Living Index, which has about sort of 21 different indicators across half a dozen domains or something like that, and that's on their website and similar other organisations have those other measures of broadly broadly, um, 
broadly defined well-being. So there are a range of measures out there, uh, and I think it's up to us to develop our own, maybe pick up the others that that um, that others are using. So there's no shortage of indicators, and dare I say, there's no shortage of measures, but there's also a sh in my opinion, a shortage of things that are actually oh, a, sh a shortage of things that, that we know are important that are difficult to measure. And Gurton indicated, you know, it's, it's easy to measure stuff where it's by time or who's first across the line. But when we're talking about things that are inherently um, intangible, things like diving or you know the equivalent of diving, how do we award scores? That's those are difficult to measure and, and those are the things that we've we've got to go into you know things like the, that social capital that social license to operate it's not easy to measure uh how well it is but dare i say we will know when we lose it we will know when it's going bad and so that's the that's a challenge in front of us all so there's no i don't have a simple answer but i don't think we should uh, shy away from that I wonder, uh, you know, is it going to be the accounting profession that leads first by saying actually beyond just the financial bottom line, you need to measure and actually bring it into accounting standards, or is it, or is it government policy through uh, regulation that says, look, you you shall measure? Well, I think it's a bit of both, undoubtedly, and, and definitely the accounting profession has a a big role to play, I think, and. Um, I always, uh, when I'm in front of a group of accountants, I argue, well, most businesses, and I've had very many business leaders will put hand on heart in front of their AGMs and say the most important asset in their business is their people. And I'll turn around and say, well, how come that's not on your balance sheet as an asset then? It's not measured. Well, uh, and that's a challenge to not just economists, that's a challenge to the accounting profession. How do we put those yeah, you know, it may not be in terms of your debt to equity ratios, but that measure of assets, how do we broaden that that definition of assets and whether we include on the balance sheet, I don't care, but it should be on your dashboard of indicators that or the scoreboard that Gurton was uh, indicating that we should have the scoreboard in front of us every how do we measure and some people might quibble and might cringe about how do we measure the value of human capital, the value of our staff. I'm not signaling we should measure it in dollars cents, but we should be measuring in terms of the health of our staff, the, the mental health, the, the the physical health, the well-being of our staff, because that's, de that's definitely where our productivity is sourced from. If our staff are not well in that broad sense, that's not, that's a, we're starting behind the start line in terms of well-being, in terms of productivity. So there are elements in there, um, yeah, accounting profession. Uh, if it gets to the point where government regulates us to do it, I think that's when we that's that's when we've failed, because government's regulating means we haven't done it right in the first place, uh, and government are regulating very much so in terms of those environmental standards that we have to report against now. So let's start. Uh, let's get proactive rather than be reactive. Nice, nice. I under I understand. Uh, Gerson, a, uh, a question for you. Uh, first of all, you talk about constantly looking at the scoreboard. Um, for those for those who know me, uh, when I play tennis, I say if you keep looking at the scoreboard, you'll miss the ball as it'll go past you. So yeah. it's probably a it's a balance of looking at the scoreboard uh, as well as uh, as well as the game. You you touch on the four aspects: uh, looking at productivity, measurement, strategy, review constantly coming back and reviewing that productivity and empowering teams. But I'm interested, uh, currently we've got uh, lockdown, we've got closed borders, and uh, a lot of what you did talk about was the people aspect. You touched on IT and technology, um, but you, you look at businesses now, have we been caught short by actually not investing enough in uh, technology and uh, AI. I read an article recently. A, a Chinese firm. It's you know, China has for years uh, relied on uh, its people power, cheap labour to produce, but now it's swinging to AI and robotics. And there's most probably a balance here between the people aspect of productivity and investing in um, IT and technology. 
Yeah, brilliant question, uh, David. So, um, so the the way I look at this is that absolutely AI and automation is is going to be a massive enabler of uh, of productivity. Um, but at the same time, when we look at uh, those organizations that then apply automation and AI, well, if they still have the people that have low level of understanding of what their business processes are all about and in what way they can actually deliver value to the customer and what the levers are to, to influence that. If we don't have that level of understanding, then if we were to automate um, uh, uh, some of those processes, then then the, then it becomes a black box that the people in that organization don't even understand. They, they are further removed than from it. So, uh, so do I believe that we have underinvested in this? Absolutely, I think we have. Uh, and so we, yeah, I'd like us to see a, a pathway uh, towards that. But that actually starts here, you know, again, using the sports analogy. You know, we, we want us to be uh, to be those top athletes, but we at the same time, we need to make sure that we we start running and, and before we start sprinting and doing really long, uh, uh, long um, uh, uh, types of exercise. So we, we need to invest in, in automation and AI, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we, we understand our business processes deeply and then technology then becomes the enabler and you know, the final enabler to um, to really capture that that additional value. Um, we have um, we have seen businesses that have automated um, and with the existing staff haven't invested in staff and their understanding of it. And the consequence is, is that uh, that people just stand back and and don't know what to do anymore. Uh, so it is it is a risk for us to to go too fast in that direction. So start by uh, start by getting our people upskilled in that in in IT, and then start applying um, AI uh, automation uh, and other um, uh, other um, uh, technological advantage uh, um, uh, advantages for that. Can I just jump in there, David? And I think that's, I mean, I linked to the Productivity Commission's Frontier Firms Inquiry, the recent inquiry we released earlier this year, which was very much about um, encouraging what we called an innovation ecosystem uh, development within New Zealand and very much from government, but also with industry and you know, entrepreneurs and unions. And, and it was um, about investment in the long haul, but about all the little pieces of the that are part of that jigsaw puzzle that makes up the ecosystem and so undoubtedly our people and our training and the skills of our workforce are critical as well as adopting the innovative whether it be robotics or ai or or what other other digital um tools we might use it's it's looking at it as a jigsaw puzzle rather than looking at it as an either or or looking at it as let's go down this one route it's we've got a and, and part of that is be prepared to invest in each of those elements of that jigsaw puzzle. So yes, you're investing in AI and robotics, but you're also investing in the skills that are able to use that and, and the structures and the systems within the corporates and organisations. There's an aspect just leading on to that. Uh, uh, one is uh, having the access to capital to be able to do that. Um, but two, also I think is, is not looking for the immediate return on that investment and appreciating um, that that actually investment might be long haul. I mean, I, I've got a client who's just spent an enormous amount uh, on a modernization of a factory, but its return on investment is, is going to be long haul. Yeah. Here. And I think actually that's what businesses need to understand, but that's the that's the challenge against shareholders who are looking for a return and a dividend uh, and therefore most probably aren't always in on that uh, investment. And I think that goes, you know, one of my key uh, messages was that shift to a long term focus rather than a short term. I think one of the elements to help that is to be clear on your co-papa. What are your company corporate organisation goals? What's your purpose? Is your purpose the focus on that ROI or the returns next year? Or are you serious about a purpose that is you're a long lived organisation, you want to make sure it's resilient for uh, and enabled to pass on to the next generation? And so there's that conversation to have with your shareholders and your stakeholders are about how much do they sign up to that purpose? Because those these are the consequences of it. You've got to wait for a return. 
and the returns may come in different ways. It may not be dollar returns. It may be uh, returns in the context of delivering higher quality products, a more um, healthy environment. It may be more healthy workforce and so on and so on. Yeah. And actually, it was probably good into your point uh, while you were talking a lot about the productivity internally as part of that strategy is was probably making that known to your investors and shareholders. So it was probably sharing that strategy externally as Excellent. well as internally. Yeah, and, and just to just to add add to that uh, conversation, I think the work that you've done, Ganesh, when, uh, with the Frontier Firms uh, study and what Frontier Firms can bring to New Zealand, um, you know, they can lead the way uh, in in adopting uh, innovative practices for uh, for their sector and then lifting entire sectors and therefore bringing bring New Zealand forward. So, would you mind just touching a bit on that because I think there's a really a relevant link uh, from the work that the Productivity Commission has uh, has done on that. Well, I think that. The, the frontier firms are critical in, in, in the phrase we like, or the analogy is to provide, I suppose, canopy cover for all the smaller, the, the smaller businesses or um, SMEs, call them what you like, to, to flourish. And so the, the, the frontier firms are not just the connection to the extent, to the overseas environment and bringing in innovation, but also then uh, distributing, but helping that uh, flow through uh, the the broader economy, whether it's the specific sector or industry, or whether it's enabling trading and um, skills development, or whether it's enabling um, better links with government, better links with Māori, iwi, all of those pieces of that jigsaw puzzle, uh, frontier firms are critical in that. And dare I say, in terms of access to finance, uh, also a critical element to play in there. Um, and, and I think that was one of the, the, the findings of the Frontier Firms one was, yeah, we're seriously short of Frontier Firms here in New Zealand. Uh, and it's part of our focus is if we're going to have a ghost with that innovation ecosystem, uh, if we're going to have that, we're going to encourage that we need more Frontier Firms and vice versa. Ganesh, just quickly on that, because um, I've heard this term frontier firms before, and I think I asked you once, uh, and I, I think you gave Ian New Zealand Fonterra Zero as an example of frontier firms, but is there such a concept as a frontier firm in a, in a region or a community, like uh, actually a, a firm that is quite significant? And if you look at, uh, I'll just quickly give an example, you look at Sleepyhead, which actually wants to set up mm -hmm. and spend 1.4 billion down in uh, Heniwai, and create a whole uh, factory and then village that lives around it. Is that can a frontier firm be something actually in a region and a community? Well, I think that the, the critical characteristics of a frontier firm is not necessarily size. Uh, it's about connections, connections upstream, downstream, across borders, and whether those borders are international borders or regional borders. So if you're talking about a regional frontier firm, the characteristic of it would be it is well connected to its other other firms and suppliers in the region and its community, but also well connected to firms and, and organisations in other regions. So it's across the boundary. So that critical characteristic of frontier firms is outward looking and also uh, and that adopting frontier uh, innovation and investment and uh, production processes or service delivery processes. So that's the, so it's very much on that frontier in terms of bringing in new ideas from outside, but also delivering those new ideas to other organisations. Nice. Do you do you think finally, um, and there's, there was a question about New Zealand's low productivity compared to countries around the world. Um, our, we seem to have low productivity. Do, do you do you think that if through COVID and the outcome of what's going on that productivity will and will will be a focus for businesses? And in fact, you'll start to see businesses try to bring back on shore some of what they outsourced overseas to actually grow. <laughs> Um, difficult to difficult to make a call on that here and now. I do think, though, that that resilience argument will become a lot more central uh, to business models, uh, and through that will become the realization that productivity is so much more important. And so, when we're talking about resilience, then that 
by definition stretches the time horizon, recognising that the world is just so much more uncertain. There are a whole lot more risks and events that we've got to prepare for, whether we like it or not. And so that's that's what I think will be the main motivator in terms of changing our business models or changing our, our time horizons. And that's actually what this series is all about, is getting businesses to stop, rethink, reset, uh, and and then actually try and realise um, a change. Um, we and we need to make changes. Yep. To to you both, uh, Ganesh and Gurton, thank you very much. Time, uh, it's amazing how quickly an hour goes. Time <laughs> is up. Um, I just remind everyone that uh, the recording of this will be up on the webinar. I do refer you to both um, the Productivity Commissioner and uh, Productivity uh, people. Uh, Gurton's business, both uh, of their websites are up available in material uh, from today's presentation and further what, what both organisations do uh, is on their website. Just reminding people that our episode 12 rethink will uh, involve Jared Kerr, the, uh, Chief Economist for Kiwi Bank on the 25th of October uh, with Taranesh Singh who heads up our uh, Head of advi Risk Advisory. Thank you very much for uh, dialing into this webinar. Um, I know as we're still in lockdown four, the firm wishes you uh, a safe time through this period. Remember your people uh, and together we'll get through this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.